You're listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author Sarah Box, where you get the inside scoop on the steps action takers and decision makers take to align their purpose to their principles and achieve their goals in business and life. We focus on the mantra, no labels, no limits, no excuses. Each week, you'll hear from remarkable guests who have overcome challenges and obstacles to succeed in the face of adversity. By listening to their stories, you'll get practical tips, tools, and resources you can implement today to bust through your own internalized prisons of worry and doubt. And now, without further ado, please welcome your commanding coach with plenty of chutzpah and heart, Sarah Box. Welcome to this episode of the No Labels, No Limits podcast, a podcast all about helping action takers and decision makers like you align your purpose to your principles and achieve your goals in business and in life. I'm Sarah from Sarah Box Coaching and Consulting. And I'm really excited to share with you our guest today, Oren Webb, founder of Enmosian Consulting. So I first learned about Oren when I was doing research for expert speakers to share their knowledge on the Assess for Success Virtual Summit, a summit designed to help nonprofit leaders in particular grow and retain top talent so that they can deliver more mission impact. And when I learned about Oren, what really kind of brought him to mind for me was his unique blend of experience, commitment, passion, and forward thinking. And all of that inspired me to reach out to him, just saying, hey, this is what I'm up to and I want to learn more about you. So then we had a conversation. And after I learned about him, more about him, his work, the path a little bit that he took to get there, I knew we needed to share him with all of you on the No Labels, No Limits podcast. So let me just give you a little more professional background on Oren, and that is that he helps people cultivate meaningful relationships, minimize inconsistency, and communicate confidently by applying emotional intelligence. And by applying emotional intelligence, intelligence, Oren helps us to be happier in our relationships, more productive with our teams, and actually better at overcoming our mental blocks. He's worked with nonprofits, businesses, and individuals to overcome their disruptive emotions by applying the Enmosian framework, resulting in personal and social breakthroughs. So in this episode, you're going to hear all about how Oren's personal experience as an orphan ultimately led him to the work of emotional intelligence and a renewed sense of self-expression. What happens when we fall into the trap of thinking others think like us, boy, is that ever a trap, and the pains (laughs) that that can cause. And he'll reveal how applying emotional intelligence can help to build confidence in relationships and ourselves and free us to become faster decision makers and better leaders, which Oren, I will tell you that I'm always interested in that. So at the end, he's going to also share with you a free gift he has for everybody. So now let's welcome our guest, Oren Webb. Hi, Oren. Hey, Sarah. How's it going? Thanks for the wonderful intro. Great. Well, it's going great. I've been excited since we planned this to actually get to do the interview with you. So before we get into all that I promised in the introduction, I do have a question for you, one that the audience and I both want to know, and that's what's one non-negotiable ritual you do daily that keeps you heading in the direction of your big vision? Absolutely. I love this question. And I I was thinking about this a little bit. And the one thing that came to mind was I consistently greet people with a lot of enthusiasm, (laughs) especially in the mornings where some people's day might be getting off to a groggy start. They sometimes ask me, where are you getting all this energy from? And I say, I'm alive. I'm here. I'm present. So I, I consistently greet people with a lot of enthusiasm. (laughs) <laughs> All right. Well, I can imagine that that not only helps them, but mm-hmm. it helps you as well. It kind of fuels you up for the day. Absolutely. It sure does. 
So, Oren, will you start by giving a little bit of background on yourself? I know that you have a lot of professional experience, but there were some things in your own history that led you to start your own business and do the yep. work that you're doing today. Yeah, yeah. So after college, I went and worked for a nonprofit, it happened to be my uh, national fraternity. And that was a really profound experience for me in that it helped me gain a lot of professional experience, but also personal experience in terms of learning more about Orrin Webb, right? And uh, I had a, a pretty troubled upbringing uh, with respect to, you know, growing up in a, you know, uh, I would say a working poor kind of household. And it really taught me the value of you know, gratitude and being able to make the most out of your opportunities. And from that experience, I always thought to myself, well, when given an opportunity, how can I make the most out of it? And so after college and, and working for my uh, uh, fraternity, I really leaned in heavily in trying to grow the organization. And that time frame exposed me to so much, Sarah, uh, in particular, emotional intelligence, because quite literally, I was building organizations on different college campuses around the United States from scratch. These are 30, 40 plus man organizations. And what that led me to realizing was, wow, at the core of so much, of what we do on a day in, day out basis are relationships and our emotions that tend to come out uh, in those relationships. So from my upbringing to that post-college experience, it really led to me having the, the energy and the enthusiasm to want to create something that could help everyday people uh, really learn the art and the skill, the power skill that is emotional intelligence. And that's why I'm here today. Well, let me ask you this, because you shared that um, your experience as an orphan also influenced you. So how did that, how does that tie in with your desire to learn and grow from emotional intelligence work? Oh, or did question. it? Yeah, it sure did. So when I was 18, I lost my dad. And about six months later, I lost my mom. Uh, they both passed away from cancer. And as a young man living in the United States, right, the culture often fed back to me, hey, don't share your emotions, right, too much. Don't kind of re repress it. And I found myself doing that. Uh, I found myself doing that all too often. And it was extraordinarily unhealthy. And from that experience of after they both passed away and, and being an orphan, uh, I was exposed to the generosity and the kindness of people when they became aware of the pain and the suffering that I experienced. And through that, by sharing that the rawness of that experience with others, uh, I, was being, I was taken in from families that uh, you know, weren't related to me in a, in a biological sense, but a part of the human family, the human fabric. And by being uh, accepted into those, those families, it opened me up to how such painful and, and tough experiences can breathe new life into experiences that help provide value to others. And I was committed, Sarah, I was committed to not falling into the pitfalls or the traps of disruptive and negative emotions. Because, you know, when, you, when two parents pass away and you're 18 years old and you don't have any wealth to inherit, right? I didn't have much. <laughs> All I had was my education. I told myself that I would continue to grow and learn and to use the pain of that experience to drive me to creating value for others. How did you... This has an assumption built into it. So if I have a wrong assumption, please correct me. But how did you walk the line between sharing your honest, raw emotions without necessarily deciding you would live in that space of constantly re-triggering and feeling um, overwhelmed by your emotions? And I'm mm -hmm. not sure I'm framing that right, mm -hmm. but you know, like, that whole thing like, okay, now I'm going to be defined by this experience versus how this experience helped me, kind of forged me to be the man I am today. Yeah, you know, and that's, a, that's an interesting question in that when it, came, when it came to how those raw emotions uh, were expressed, 
I did a lot of time thinking about why me, right? That was a, that was a constant emotion. Or I was feeling this more, more or less uh, confusion, doubt, fear. All of that was kind of bundled into one. And as I reflected on the pain, the deeper I went, Sarah, the, uh, I, I arrived at this thought of, I am my own creator of, the, of my life experience. And literally at the root of my being, at, at, when I went into that space, there was, a, there was a, an emotion of, of light and, and, and I would say, uh, I wouldn't call it joy, but it was almost like a positive energy of some sort, right? At the root of going past the depths of all those dark and disruptive emotions, I arrived at this, this sense of, of light. That's the way I could just call it. And when I, when I became aware of that, it, was, it, it washed over me. And I said, you know, from this experience, this, this tough experience, it won't define me. However, it will give life to a new me. And that's exactly what happened. Perfect. That, thank you for clarifying that for me. So talk to us a little bit about what happens when we start thinking that others think like us. What, you talk about that being a trap. Yeah. yeah. I think it is a massive trap, in part because, uh, in the words of Thomas Jefferson, uh, he he said that human beings are imitable creatures, right? We tend to imitate one another, and think about who are the first people we imitate. We imitate our parents, and so we oftentimes will see our parents as right, like they are doing the right thing. So let me imitate how they are, and this trap of thinking people think like us oftentimes leads us, it leads to it backfiring, right? And, you know, another way to think about this is assuming, right? When we assume that we know how others are thinking about things, it oftentimes can backfire. So that trap can lead to a lot of pitfalls and can actually restrict us from opportunities of building authentic, meaningful relationships. And one of the things I'm really keen on is leading with curiosity right? You know, initiating relationships from the standpoint of questions rather than statements, right? Um, and that has done a, a world difference for me because rather than going to the conversation or the interaction with another, claiming that they may be like me, I oftentimes go into it with questions like, help me understand, or how are you, or what are your preferences? And that really goes a long way. That's so funny because um, that's exactly what you did when I reached out to you. And I reached out to you with questions, but before you would answer any of my questions, you said, well, I have questions for you. And I'm thinking, (laughs) wait a minute. How about it? I got questions for you. So um, what, when you started that approach, what did you notice changed for you? A big thing that changed for me was I, I was more patient. I was way more patient with my listening, and I was more intentional about my word choice and my language. And with with that, I found myself feeling more connected to the other person, and not in this sort of this sort of way where you're trying to you know build some relationship for some sort of gain, but it was a real authentic connection. And I'll tell you, back back in uh, my college days, I was I I had the, the, this raw talent of like getting into meaningful dialogue with people. Some people were intimidated, and I I, I had received that feedback once <laughs> that it was intimidating to connect with me because I sometimes would move past the surface into the depths of how people are pretty quickly, and. Uh, as I got that feedback and learned and started to you know, develop these frameworks, like what I teach in In Motion, I learned that everybody, you know, you kind of move, they're on their own journey and people kind of, you got you to gotta get to that place at different levels, right? We don't want to just dive right in with people. You want to kind of take your time depending on who you're talking to and, you know, what you learn just from those uh, initial questions. Tired of feeling stuck and ending with the same result? Want to know how Sarah can help you with one-on-one or organizational coaching? Then book your free discovery call at sarahbox.com forward slash contact. Now, back to the show. 
So let's talk. You mentioned in motion, right? Mm -hmm. So that's uh, over the scheme of your life. It's a yep. fairly young business, right? Mm -hmm. But it's yep. evolved out of continual years of work. So can you talk a little bit about the design of that, how you think about your business and your, kind of your framework, your approach to helping people? Absolutely. So in motion uh, was born out of my experiences in my, uh, uh, at my national fraternity when I worked on the professional staff. And I, I had so many conversations there with young people across the country. I was meeting people from all different identities, uh, all different uh, you know, uh, upbringings. And it just exposed me to the diversity, not just of one's background or, or race or economic status, but the diversity of how people think. I call it cognitive diversity, right? And when I had my own troubles with dealing with my emotions, those disruptive emotions that I'm sure many people may run into when working with supervisors or uh, working with friends or family, those disruptive emotions were holding me back. I, you know, you, you'll feel it sometimes. It's like a weight on your chest. I'm like, oh, this is, this is tough. So um, in motion was born out of becoming aware of two particular frameworks. The first framework being emotional intelligence. Th that body of work was first picked up by uh, Peter Solovey and John Mayer uh, over at you know, some of the Ivy League schools. And then it really was brought to the attention of the public by Daniel Goleman. And Goleman was really like the advocate of EI. And when I was exposed to that work, I learned like, wow, this is exactly what I can benefit from the value that I could gain from it. But I'll tell you, there was one missing element to the emotional intelligence framework. And just to give you a snapshot, a key part of the framework is self-awareness. Self-awareness can be a funny thing <laughs> because we're so, we have so many different parts to us. And I believe that the, the, the emotional intelligence framework was missing something uh, oriented around self-awareness that could give us a new way to look at ourselves. And that's when I became aware of the Myers-Briggs type indicator in the, in, how, in the depths of that personality uh, type framework. So I fused them together. I fused them together to create an, an, the emotion methodology, which takes people into the world of emotional intelligence from the lens of their personality. Now, from that connection, I said, okay, if I, if I gained so much value from this, and some of my coworkers in the past gained a lot of value from the workshops we've done, I can only imagine that everyday people could definitely benefit from this. And here's the big gap that I noticed, Sarah. I noticed that only management level and executive level people were getting targeted and exposed to this sort of work, this sort of uh, uh, executive level coaching, personal development, you know, really team dynamic work. And I thought to myself, well, the everyday person can benefit from this, right? Whether you're in a family, whether you're in a relationship, or even if you're on the front lines of a business, whether you're a business development representative or an associate at a research firm, you could benefit from expanding your awareness of these. Uh, different frameworks. So thus, in motion was born to deliver that level of value to the everyday person for them to gain that level of sustainable confidence, but expose them to and also expose them to a, a new way of seeing not only themselves, but also the people that they interact with in order to foster more healthy and meaningful relationships. So, and I want to let our listeners know that you're actually going to walk through that framework as part of the virtual summit. So we won't go into That's detail right. here on it, but for, and the virtual summit's free. So anybody who wants to participate in that and ha hear or and go through all of that, we'll have a link in the show notes for that, as well as to all of Oren's information. But Oren, when you, I'm going to ask you to think about some of the folks you have worked with through Enmotion, and yep. what have you noticed has kind of evolved for them? You talk about how this work can help people have more confidence and mm -hmm. be 
faster decision makers or better leaders. What, how has that played out for some of your clients and the groups you work with? Absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you're asking this. And uh, one of my recent uh, students slash clients in my program really struggled with managing her emotions. And uh, she found that by going through my course, she was able to unlock and develop a new lens, a new frame of reference when it came to those disruptive emotions. Now, emotions go to the core of oftentimes how we make decisions. Now, that may sound counterintuitive because some may think, I like to make decisions purely off numbers and logic. But here's the thing. Some people have an emotional connection to numbers and logic. <laughs> they believe in it, right? They, they feel connected to it. So this uh, client in particular was um, going through some, some challenges of, uh, she had moved from her home state to a new place, got a new job, and was really undergoing some new life experiences. And <clears throat> she found herself having trouble with cultivating and developing meaningful relationships. So uh, through my program, she was exposed to her own personality type uh, from the lens of emotional intelligence. So we activated her self-awareness. We expanded it. But then we took a deeper dive into uh, another aspect of my program, which is the shadow personality. Now, she found a lot of value in examining what happens when disruptive emotions overtake her. And she talked about different, you know, uh, disruptive emotions like anxiety, uh, you know, stress lingering around, uh, sadness. All of these things would kind of uh, spin out of her uh, being triggered by some sort of exterior or external uh, experience happening, whether somebody made a comment toward her or whether someone didn't respond well to how she may have been interacting with them. And <clears throat> after the program, a big thing for her was being able to see people for how they are was a new awakening for her. Oftentimes we look at who is this person? And when we say who, we mean their role, what is the job they do, what is their name, where are they from? She began to look at individuals and learn about individuals from the lens of how they are. Looking at learning about them and interacting with them from a standpoint of their preferences. So this resulted in her changing and adapting and developing three things how she communicated with them in terms of the sort of language she used in the questions, how she managed conflict that may arise with those individuals by seeking to understand before seeking to be understood. And then third, how she addressed change. She was now more aware, had more clarity around her triggers. So she was going into change with a preventative mindset of you know avoiding triggers rather than just stepping into it and being you know going through the disruptive emotions process. So she really gained a lot of value uh, from that standpoint. When we get triggered or find ourselves in a disruptive emotions process, how long does it take us to get our equilibrium back? That's a great question, and this goes to the heart of emotional management. Oftentimes, there is a belief that. Some people can just like not feel anything, right? And I'm not doubting that. And there may be some people out there that, you know, don't feel anything due to a neurological uh, um, situation. But everyone will feel, they will feel sensations physically. But there's a distinction to, to note here. Feelings are what you're going to encounter from a bodily standpoint. Emotions are the thoughts you associate with the feelings. And this is some groundbreaking research that uh, Lisa Barrett, Dr. Barrett, uh, has been uh, pushing the envelope on. And one of the big developments, as you, you were hinting at, emotional intelligence doesn't necessarily stop you from experiencing disruptive emotions, but it significantly can reduce the amount of time that it sticks. Emotions are sticky. And so by practicing emotional intelligence, by you know, doing, doing some of the work that that entails, you could significantly reduce the amount of time you're letting those emotions hover over you, right? Think about that rain cloud <laughs> that you know, when you're feeling sad, it's like, oh my goodness, I can't shake this feeling. By practicing and applying emotional intelligence, you're able to shake that feeling 
uh, arguably half the time, maybe even a third of the time. Because that's just kind of a reaction we're getting based on what we think about how we're feeling, right? Exactly. I yep. think about it as like that spin we can go into where all of a sudden things were good and all of a sudden now your mind's like spinning, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes it's kind of, I think about it as like the metaphor of there it goes, it's going out on the ocean on a boat and here I am on the wharf because I forgot to remember I'm in charge. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> Hello. exactly. So, um, and I don't want to go too much into the framework right now, but that's pretty powerful for her. And Mm -hmm. I would imagine she felt freer because of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a big thing that she mentioned was not, not, she said, I don't cry as much anymore. (laughs) When we had our follow up call after she had uh, finished the program was, she said, I'm not, I'm not crying as much as I used to because I've, I've become more resilient. And I wanted to affirm to her and validate, it's totally okay to cry, right? It's all right. Now, I said, and we, and we agreed like, hey, it's the amount of time you're spending in that space that saps you of time and energy. So now that you have these frameworks, go out there and use it, and it's gonna help you in the long run. So how does that help us be better decision makers? Yes, great question. So when we think about making decisions, it oftentimes is associated with our personality. How do we prefer to do things? And this is where that personality type framework comes in handy. The more you know about how you work, the better off you're going to be in making decisions that help you get XYZ job done. And as I said before, when we're making decisions, we oftentimes have our emotions associated with it right? Think about when you are, say, looking to make a sort of investment. There's oftentimes an emotion associated with it, whether it's you looking good or avoiding looking bad, or you winning over someone's, uh, uh, you know, perception, right? You know, being able to become an influencer of some sort in the view of others. Nine times out of 10, this is associated with how we are feeling about something and then the way we think about the feeling. So, When it comes to making decisions that are going to be more beneficial to you, it oftentimes takes a level of reflection and application, not just simply doing. I know there is, you know, action obviously is necessary, right? But think about what is action without reflection and applying the insights you gain from the reflection to the next action. And when we when the reflection process includes you know self examination activating your self awareness and using the power skill of emotional intelligence in order for you to make more proactive preventative healthy decisions going forward and underlying all that is your self awareness yeah yeah absolutely yeah. yep so talk to us about the your course and mm-hmm. um kind of if I were to be one of your students, what would that experience be like for me? Absolutely. So my course is called uh, Outsmarting Emotions, and it is an online course that includes a level of live coaching with me. So I wanted to create an experience for people to develop emotional intelligence and apply it in their own personal lives and in their work lives in a way that it could be self-paced, right? Um, And through that self-pacing process, individuals can go through the entire program as as quickly as they want, or they can take it at a at a um, a, you know a a section by section with me being a live coach. Now the program has five uh, distinct uh, lectures associated with it, and they 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 are built off of the model of emotional intelligence that I apply. Layer one being self awareness getting into accurate self-assessment, and being able to recognize certain emotions. Layer two is self-management, being able to better practice control and, and you know, initiate motivation towards things that you may want to do or accomplish. Layer three is social awareness. And that takes the, the framework uh, and puts it out there, right? Puts it out in the world. That way you can start to see it uh, more clearly in your day in and day out experiences. And then fourth, uh, the fourth layer is relationship management, 
this is where you're getting a lot of the actionable insights of how should I go about communicating with XYZ person? How should I go about, you know, shaping my day? And what sort of things can I do to, you know, avoid conflict or if I'm in conflict, better navigate through it without, uh, you know, falling victim to a host of disruptive emotions. So through those layers, you're looking at typically about a six to eight week long program that allows for you to explore the the world of emotional intelligence and personality type as a unified framework to help you uh, really build long-term sustainable confidence, not only in yourself, but in the way you go about making relationships. Sounds like you apply that all the time, huh? I do my best, Sarah. I really do. I'm trying. <laughs> that's, that's all any of us that can do is our best. <laughs> so about it? talk to us about, because we all like presents, talk mm-hmm. to us about the gift that you're giving us, our listeners, and anybody on the show. Yes. So for all of you wonderful people out there who are listening to this podcast right now, you will be allowed to get access to my personality playbook. Uh, it is a wonderful resource that takes you through the, the combined framework of emotional intelligence and personality types. And you quite literally can go into it, identify which personas you connect with, and maybe even uh, you know, share with your friends and your family and point out what sort of persona they are and have meaningful conversations around what that's like and really start to engage in uh, emotional intelligence and applying it and activating it right from just reading the book. It's only 27 pages. It's, uh, it's not like a super dense book, but it's, it's enough for you to get uh, some value out of and to really begin the journey of applying emotional intelligence and learning more about how you are. So, Oren, I know that we get to talk again soon, and I also know I get to share you more broadly again on a virtual summit. But I do want to ask you, if you were going to leave someone with a word of advice, maybe they're going through something like you did at 18, 19, what word of advice or suggestion might you have to help them navigate that rain cloud over their head space? Yes. So there's a saying I tell myself more often than not, and it is this. When you are uncomfortable, that is the first sign that there is something new to learn. And in my life, during the times in which I've experienced discomfort, I've been you know, shaken by life experiences, or my, my, my emotions have been rattled by Uh, you know, the death of loved ones, it was a signal for me to learn more about myself and to learn more about uh, the the environment and the life that I was in. And through that learning, I was able to, you're able to examine things in in a new way or renewed way. And you can consider it a possibility or an opportunity to refresh how you present yourself and your gifts to the world. I think we will end on that piece of wisdom. And I want to thank you again for being a guest, Oren. I've really enjoyed this getting to know you more and learning how you've changed your own lens. Because I know for me personally, that's always been the key for getting unstuck. And I love the approach that you use. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. And I love this podcast. (laughs) It's a love fest. Okay. (laughs) We'll be back next week. You've been listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author, change agent, and strategic vision coach, Sarah Box. You can grab the show notes and find out how to work with Sarah at sarahbox.com forward slash no labels, no limits podcast. We'd love this podcast to reach as many people as possible. So please remember to rate, leave a five-star review and share the podcast with someone you think would get value from this conversation. Until next time, keep taking those daily action steps to align your purpose to your principles and achieve your goals in business and life.